I'd like to welcome everybody. I'm Charlie Robbins. I am the uh, executive director of the Center for Changing Systems of Power and a professor in the School of Social Welfare here at, at Stony Brook University. Um, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to uh, what I know will be an incredibly exciting conversation tonight. Um, let me introduce um, all of the people on the screen that you're seeing. Um, and, and then we will get started with the first part of our program. So joining me in, in moderating the conversation tonight is, is a colleague and, and I believe I'm able to say a friend. Um, you know, we've been doing a lot of programs together and, and that's Dr. Zebulon Boletsky. Um, he is an associate professor of Africana Studies um, here at Stony Brook University. And he has a, a new book called uh, Before Busing, Boston's Long Freedom Movement in the Cradle of Liberty. And it's being published by the University of North Carolina Press and will be released later this year. And we'll have one of these conversations with him too when the, when the book is out um, and, and talk about it. He is a historian specializing in recent African-American history, civil rights and black power, urban history, mixed race and biracial identity and hip hop studies. His research in interests include African-Americans in Boston, Northern freedom movements outside of the South, mixed race history in the United States and passing. He is the author of numerous articles, reviews, essays and book chapters and has his PhD from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, um, which he received in 2008. You're so young, it's terrible. Um, and now, the, the, my, the guests for, for this evening that we are so thrilled to welcome to our campus, even, even virtually. Um, let me start with, with Violet Payne, who has a, a BS degree in, in mathematics and chemistry from the University of Texas and an MBA from Columbia University's Graduate School in Business. She has served as a supervising business analyst at the Stony Brook University Hospital since September 1989. Because of her affinity for Stony Brook and deep commitment to promoting diversity in education, she has established the Violet and Les Payne Endowed Scholarship in Medicine. Violet and her late husband Les believe in the importance of recruiting and training a diverse population of medical students so that our future medical professionals reflect the current and future patient base. Violet and Les are passionate about helping underrepresented students on their path to success by increasing access to a quality medical education. It is their hope that this scholarship will provide students from underrepresented groups with access to a world-class education at the Renaissance School of Medicine here at Stony Brook University. Violet, thank you for that. Um, and we'll get to talk a lot more as we go on. Next, I'd like to introduce Tamara Payne, uh, people call Tammy. Um, and, and she is the co-author of The Dead Are Arising, The Life of Malcolm X, which was written with her father, uh, the Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, Les Payne. And obviously we're gonna talk a lot more about that this evening. Tamara was the principal researcher for her father while also working as a commercial real estate person. And, and so hats off to you. After Les's sudden passing in 2018, Tamara made it her purpose to finish this, his life's work. Um, and she did it masterfully. And when you read the introduction and you read the, the conclusion, um, you just hear Les and, and feel the love in, in the book. So uh, my hat's off to you. It was an amazing job um, all of these years and, and just transcribing all of his interviews and, and, and doing all of that work on this book. It is, it is wonderful. Um, and then last, but certainly not least, because I don't want to get into any of the sibling stuff again, um, Jamal Payne is an established uh, digital streaming and web content um, who works with curation space who believes in the value and importance of the expansive and progressive nature of video content delivery as we settle into the new digital age. He currently works as a supervisor of media management for MLB Network and among his duties um, he manages a team of a dozen people creating, curating, and delivering web video 
content over the many linear and digital channels across the, the ecosystem that's associated with Major League Baseball, the Major League Baseball Network, the NHA, NHL Network, and digital partners. He's a graduate of Tulane University with a Bachelor of Arts degree in economics. But during his time at Tulane and after graduation, he was introduced to the magical world of video production and has spent many years working on various levels of video production from production assistant to edit, editor, to live studio director, to video producer in many levels and jobs in between. Along with his day job at MLB Network, Jamal is currently working on a video project focusing on the story of, of Les Payne's life, his career, and his legacy. So I am real, I've been and am really looking forward to tonight's program. Uh, we're sort of going to divide this into halves, but we know it's, it's going to go together because they're inseparably connected. Um, so we're going to start off with, with a discussion about Les Payne um, and, and his contribution uh, and legacy. Uh, and, and then we're going to transition in, into talking about the book. So let me tell you, um, for those of you that, that don't know Les, let me tell you a little bit about him. He was born on July 12, 1941 in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. His family moved in 1954 to Hartford, Connecticut. And then in March, 2018, he suddenly died at the age of 76. The New York Times wrote that Les Payne was a fervid and fearless Pulitzer Prize winning reporter, columnist and editor for Newsday who helped pave the way for a generation of black journalists. Beginning in 1969, when he first joined Newsday, Mr. Payne exposed inequality and racial injustice wherever he found it, whether it was apartheid in South Africa, illegally segregated schools in the American South, or redlining by real estate agents right here in suburban New York. He was on the team that won a Pulitzer Prize for public service in 1974 for the 33 part series, The Heroin Trail, which traced a narcotic scourge from its source in Turkey through the French connection to the streets of New York and Long Island. Mr. Payne was a foreign correspondent, a teacher at Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism, and a founding member and former president of the National Association of Black Journalists. He was also inducted into their Hall of Fame. After high school, he enrolled at the University of Connecticut in stores where he switched from a major in engineering and earned a bachelor's degree in English. And I, for one, am glad he did. He spent six years in the army serving as a ranger in Vietnam where among other things, he wrote speeches for General William C. Westmoreland, the American commander. He was discharged at the rank of captain. Among his first undercover assignments for Newsday was to spend a month in a migrant labor camp in Riverhead here on Eastern Long Island laying irrigation pipe on a potato farm. The grueling work evoked memories of picking cotton when Les was eight years old for $2 per hundred pounds. Quote, much has changed in the world since 1949, he wrote, but little I found has improved for black farm laborers, end quote. In 1978, he was a Pulitzer Prize finalist and I think should have won for international reporting for an 11 part series on South Africa. Once he was armed with a weekly column, he established a reputation as a passionate champion of people who were powerless to defend themselves. I personally was a huge admirer of his work and religiously read every column he wrote. After Tawana Brawley, a black teenager created a nationwide uproar in 1987 when she accused four white men of raping her in upstate New York, Mr. Payne dauntlessly des described the incident as a hoax and braved scathing criticism from Ms. Brawley's most outspoken defender, including the Reverend Al Sharpton. Mr. Payne was the first to fully report an account by Ms. Brawley's former boyfriend that she told him she had been neither assaulted nor raped. When he first sought an assignment in Africa, Mr. Payne recalled he was told by his editors that a black reporter's judgment might be compromised. But once he got there, he learned that being black was not necessarily an advantage. While he was reporting from the newly independent Zimbabwe, where rival guerrilla groups were still squaring off, one faction saw him taking photographs 
and mistook him for a spy. Quote, my death warrant was signed. I was going to be killed. It was all over, end quote. He later recalled according to the, an account in the Northeast Magazine in 1986. But he was rescued at the last minute by soldiers from, a nation, from the National Army and wrote an account for the newspaper accompanied by some soul searching about having decided to become a foreign correspondent in the first place. Prior to coming to Stony Brook, I regularly read Les Payne's column and reporting. He was brilliant. His writing was eloquent. He spoke truth to power and never failed to challenge our beliefs and actions. As some of you know, I first came to Stony Brook as the director of the social work department at what was then the university hospital. Our budget analyst for our area was someone named Violet Payne. That was back in 1989. Now I'm not proud of this, but it took some time before I realized that Violet Payne and Les Payne were actually an amazing couple raising their three children. Les Payne became a featured speaker at the annual Counseling and Treating People of Color Conference that was founded by Dr. Francis Brisbane, who was on this Zoom call tonight. Dr. Brisbane afforded me the honor of introducing Les Payne each year and moderating his sessions. Each year we would talk about his progress on his book about Malcolm X, and he always knew it was going to get published. Our final time together was when we traveled to Ghana and shared some amazing experiences. But one final note, I always brought a group of undergraduate students to the conference with me. Les Payne was always so generous with his time and experience with these young people. That's just who he was. Thank you. Dr. Maletsky. Oh, thank you, Charlie, um, and uh, greetings and welcome to everybody who's uh, watching this evening. Um, that uh, introduction recalls so many fond memories and uh, <clears throat> inspiring moments uh, from the People of Color Conference that you uh, mentioned, which I had the good fortune to be invited to and be able to attend uh, by uh, Dr. Brisbane and yourself. And, um, and I learned so much. Uh, and one of the things I, I learned about uh, was about uh, Mr. Les Payne and his lovely family um, because uh, Mr. Jamal Payne was actually the speaker the, that year. And as I, I just found out, that was a um, uh, tremendous uh, uh, undertaking because uh, that was meant to be uh, less uh, coming and speaking and had had some role in bringing it to New Orleans, I understand. And so, uh, uh, so I have some familiarity with this family legacy and this powerful legacy. I wanna say congratulations on winning the National Book Award. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, to you and to 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 uh, to your to to the family, uh, it's a uh, you know what a what a beautiful way to celebrate uh, his legacy, uh, one which was obviously a family affair, uh, very much so. And what a special opportunity to have uh, three members of the Payne family, uh, one of whom is the co-author of this award-winning book, um, and it's. For those of us who study African American history, it's a powerful new, uh, you know, study on in a biography, an importantly needed biography, in my opinion, a, a retelling uh, of, of not a retelling, but a uh, a telling of of many tellings, uh, starting with Alex Haley's uh, "As Told To" book, as they, they called it, and um, and some along the way, including book by Manning Marable, which I'm sure always comes up and may come up in discussion tonight. Um, uh, compared with those who, you know, my understanding is the dead are rising, uh, set about to speak to those who knew Malcolm um, and did so intentionally. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, as you heard, I do some work on Boston, my book on Boston, 
uh, here, uh, and I happen to be in Boston right now, about you know, a mile or so from Roxbury, the neighborhood, one of the neighborhoods, one of the many places that Malcolm lived, and everywhere that Malcolm lived, it touched people and everyone from Omaha, Nebraska, to Milwaukee, to Lansing, to Roxbury, to Harlem, uh, claims Malcolm in some way, shape, or form. The Malcolm that they knew, the Malcolm that they remember, uh, but. But, uh, but getting back to, I, you know, I'm not even sure where to begin, uh, uh, but I guess Tamara, I will probably address a question to you or to whomever would like to answer it. But um, uh, you mentioned that this was a family affair. You described uh, in great detail in the introduction how, how you became involved uh, uh, really literally since childhood from what I could, could understand uh, in some of the stories you share. Um, uh, how did how did this book come about? Um, why was it so important to Les Payne to to finish this book, to write this book throughout all these long years? Um, what can we help us to you know understand how you entered into this and 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 carried it really through to the finish? Um. Thank you for that question, and um, thank you, everybody, for coming tonight and, and, and joining us in this discussion. Um, yeah, my father was influenced by Malcolm X. He was a, he admired Malcolm. He had seen him speak in Hartford, but um, you know, my father was also a journalist, and what he felt um, prior to meeting Malcolm's brothers is that he, we had already we have everything we needed to know about Malcolm from his speeches which I documented in my introduction, how my father used to play that in the house while I was growing up. And uh, to the autobiography, which many of us, everybody I'm sure on this panel has at least read a few times. And, um, you know, and he felt that we had everything we needed to know about this great American hero. And so, but when he comes, and this happens I think with a lot of these a lot of our people that we admire and we don't know personally, but when he got to meet um, pe people who grew up with Malcolm, his brothers, he realized that there's a side of Malcolm that we don't know about, but also is just as important to understanding Malcolm, the man that we've come to admire. And so having after those first meetings um, and he met them through his childhood friend, Walter O. Evans in Detroit, um, just learning about the family growing up what that family was like, because up until that point, Malcolm, and let's say he had this first interview in 1990. Up until that point, Malcolm has been presented to us fully formed and angry, and as if he had sprung out of nowhere. And so this, what dad was learning was what was Malcolm like when, before he was born even, because we opened up the book where he, his mother, Louise, is pregnant with him. And but what was he like as a child? What was he like as a baby? What kind of games did he play? You know, um, what was his relationship with his father? What was his relationship with his other siblings? And, you know, and, and what was the, what was he like in return? You know, um, the first brother he, my father met with was, um, you know, in Detroit and, he, and my dad had this great long interview with him. He comes back to New York and he meets with Gil Noble who's another journalist here in New York uh, who has since passed away, but also very important to those of us here in New York, tri-state areas. Um, he knew Malcolm's family. He also said, you, the brother you really should speak to is Wilfred. My brother had spoken with Philbert who was two years older than Malcolm. And after this conversation with Gil Nova, he goes back to Detroit and he interviews Wilfred who was six years older than Malcolm, but also uh, was Malcolm's best friend. And so now you're getting kind of a framing of Malcolm from these two brothers. One is closer in age to Malcolm and one who's six years older than Malcolm and his best friend and confidant throughout his life. And so it is that. And then dad, who's a journalist to his core, he's not a historian, he's not a scholar, he's a journalist. He wants to know what's new. And this is all new information. But he also makes the connection that this is also important to understanding who Malcolm is. Yeah. yeah. So I just really want to make the concise answer is that we want to learn more about Malcolm, who he was in the context of his family, but also in the context of the world he was born into. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Family is important here. And uh, we have, you know, I'm, you know we, we started with that conversation. This was a family affair. 
uh, uh, so to speak. Um, and, and it's one that has strong Long Island connections and ties, uh, as was read uh, in the bio, um, but uh, maybe not even caught, but he was editor at Newsday uh, mm -hmm. for, for many, many years. Um, uh, won Pulitzer's on issues, you know, not related necessarily to uh, race per se, but 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 obviously this speech in Hartford, Connecticut. That's what one thing I love. I, I, you know, the, the the Malcolm in the New England context, being that I'm you know Boston focus. Um, uh, this speech in in Hartford that that, that connected with him. Uh, he, 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 we talk about it in the book, but but I would love to hear you know from some of the other members of the family. How did it affect you? Um, um, uh, if you if there's any stories you could share that could help us to sort of uh, you know that illustrate you know uh, uh, that I, I've had a chance to hear some of them from Jamal and the pain in the past, and and uh, you know um, how well, did one of the stories. Um... I always relate to is what we as a group, we, even with our second, their second, uh, their third sibling, um, Hailey, who's in Orlando, Florida. But um, we talk about how people look at Malcolm X. And I think that this went throughout the discussions and the, and the building of this book is that People only knew Malcolm as a as an adult. They just we we were presented by the press as coming here fully formed. We don't know anything, as Tammy always says about how did he get here, what happened, you know how was he as a child, and I think we always think of Malcolm as. Uh, the young man with that, those glasses and that suit and him pointing his finger to emphasize. <laughs> but he at one time was young and he developed to what he was that we uh, feel is fully formed. <laughs> and the story that I'd like to share is, um, as Charlie Robbins at the top said, my dad is, he was born in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Um, Tuscaloosa is a Native American word. It's actually Choctaw. It means black warrior. Tusca means warrior. Lusa means black. So like my dad is from a place called Black Warrior and he lived there till he was 12. And then he came north to Connecticut. And so he, as his family, was part of the migration of uh, blacks that came north. You know, very similar to what you were reading of how Earl Little, as Tammy will get into, moves north. And, you know, and so like, it, this is a, you know, and, and so many uh, black Americans, this, this path and pattern is gonna be very familiar. It's going to be, you know what I mean? And so what my father and my sister are doing are they returning Malcolm to his actual story. And what you're gonna understand of his origin story is it's very similar to the story that our grandmothers and grandfathers told us and our great grandfathers and grandmothers and our aunts and uncles and the story that they continue to tell us. These are the stories of how that migration was and coming forth and understanding that coming out of that, you may look at Malcolm a little bit differently if you understand what they were going up against when you're talking about exclusive land, uh, covenants and you know different rules and 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 codes and you know and all of those kind of things and um and you know and so that it's it's very important and um you know one of the things that my father you know just always imported into us was you know about you know as my sister said he's a journalist and so he's collecting information and you know and I know that what's in this book is is sourced and it's information and you know what I mean and we can read this and I mean, it's beautifully written and curated by my sister. And, you know, I mean, it is just, it's, it's a masterwork. And, you know what I mean? And, and it's just a wonderful, you know, summation of, of his career. But I mean, this is journalism done at the highest level. And I mean, and that's the biggest thing. I mean, outside of it being about Malcolm, this is journalism. I mean, sourced material that is, you know, uh, interwoven with the historical record you know, and, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's corroborated. And, you know, and this is what my dad was able to, you know, to collect and the information that he was able to collect and synthesize with his, uh, you know, 
40 years of journalism experience. Yes, yes. Don't, don't before we, okay. I'm sorry. No, before we dive into the book in a, in a minute, can, can you each just tell us something that you want us to know about Less the Man? Um, and and what you think his his impact is going forward far be far beyond this book not to negate anything about the book but he he was so much of this book and and, and so much more so w what's just something that you want those watching tonight to to know about less the man um before and then we'll dive more into into the book itself all right, uh, Charlie, thank you. Um, I think that what I most want people to know is that he was a very well-rounded person. Um, he cared about his family and he was very active when he could be with raising the kids. We believed in raising children, our children, to become world citizens. We, because you would come because they needed that in order to be able to deal with the world. And so um, Les and I did come out of, of a generation of people whose parents and grandparents were trying to escape from the South, but we tried to instill in our children to look forward and to be the best that they could and to broaden their horizon. Also, Les was very much into arts of any type, whether it was performing, but particularly, we love to collect art from the Black diaspora. I'm, that was very much what we wanted our kids to see. We surrounded our house with that. So when people came in and they saw these pictures on our walls and everything, they would say, well, you don't have a Picasso. Not that we could afford one, but we wanted our children to see themselves in paintings. And I mean, that's how um, we have always um, lived on Long Island, even though Long Island didn't live like this for us. But we made it through it. Wonderful. I Wonderful. don't know if that, if you wanted additional, but he always <laughs> wanted to write. Oh. <laughs> um, what, what I would like to share about my father, and this is something as a son, he would, you know, tell me all the time that as a man and as a black man in this country, that he paid his obligation for citizenship. And that's with his service in the military for six years. And that even though he did that, the, the, uh, he was not necessarily able to reap the full benefits of citizenship. And that is something that has played out throughout this book. And uh, I mean, he would, he would talk about this all the time. And, uh, you know, and he would talk about how his uncles paid the obligations of citizenship and how black men served this country. And he would say that we deserve, and this is not a request, but we earn the right to reap the benefits of citizenship in full. And we have, you know, put in the work and it's time to collect what is due. And he would talk about Dr. King. And I know we're going to get to Dr. King in relation and as he relates to Malcolm X. But when we talk about Dr. King, we don't really talk about what the speech on Washington was about. Because when Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was talking about during that speech, he says, quote, we have come to Washington today with a check mark insufficient funds and we're here to collect, unquote. But his speech has been whitewashed and white splained to simply be about dreaming. Martin was not dreaming. He was not asleep. He was woke way before that was even a thing. And he had a list of demands that America is still delinquent in addressing. And my father would talk to us about this all of the time. And you know, and so I, and I know we're gonna get into this conversation about what does this mean and what does it mean in real time? But Dr. King was he was on top of it and he was not this dreaming guy who only thought about the content of character. He also was there to say, we have been here and we demand what is rightfully ours. And I mean, my dad was 
he, he, that's what his reporting was about. That's what his life was about. And, you know, and I think that's what his work is about. Wonderful. Thank you. Tammy? Um, and I like to just say about my father, he had a, a voracious curiosity. And as mom had mentioned, his interest in art and music, and he just exposed us to so much with letters and books. He used to read books with me, me and my brothers um, when we were younger. Uh, we read Native Son, we read Black Boy, we read, we read Shakespeare, we read Mark Twain. Oh, no. um, and, and, you know, and I, you know, with, was very interested in getting into journalism and writing. And dad and I would often talk about it. And I remember when I, uh, when I discovered Zora Neale Hurston and he and I would talk about the black women writers of the eighties, you know, that were becoming known like Toni Morris and Alice Walker, but just talking about the context of one, they struggled to get to where they were, where we actually knew who they were. Zora Neale Hurston died unknown. Um, and, and that was a moment that my father and I bond on was learning who she was, he relearning her, but, you know, me just saying, wow, you know, this is an amazing woman and, and just bonding on that. But he had a voracious um, curiosity. And the other thing is that, you know, through all of his experience, like we talked about how he grew up in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, but he was also born in Jim Crow South. And we talk about the obstacles that he experienced with his family going up North. And of course, when I was working in real estate, yeah, when I came across these exclusionary clauses in the deeds to the lands that the little family ha was purchasing in, in Lansing, you know, that was incredible to come across, just to understand that there were actual laws. And so it's what dad was showing was, and it has always kind of taught us is that we have to understand histories and context. Everybody has histories. And whether even, you know, when we talk about white supremacy, there are histories to that and to understand the, the larger context of all of this. And so in the case of Malcolm, what we're doing, we're putting him in context into his story, into the history of American history. And this is American history. It's not just black history. This is American history that we have to come, that we really do need to deal with. And Malcolm, you know, who's, who keeps coming up because people keep turning to him because he critiqued this country and what they were doing with the blacks, with their black citizens and not recognizing uh, our civil rights. And this has continued. And so what he was talking about in back, back in 1965, it still holds true today because we have not made people who are benefiting from oppressing black people and not recognizing our civil rights and the civil rights of others who come into this country who are not of the right caste, as if we want to use this Bill Wilkerson's uh, language, um, we, they're not held accountable for this. And so that here's a question for us to look into and to why this is. But this book, we're looking at Malcolm and we're putting it in the context of American history for us to deal with them. And dad, his whole purpose was, we really need to understand, again, the context. So every time a lot of people focus on certain aspects of Malcolm, I always say, if you read the book, you have to also look at the context of where Malcolm was at that time in his life, starting with his age. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So we're going to transition now. Let me um, tell the audience a, a little bit about the book, and, and then um, we're going to transition to some of the questions from the participants, but also um, give Tammy a, a chance to speak a little bit more about it. So I um, am preparing for today's program. Um, I had the opportunity to watch videos of, of Tammy speaking about her father in this book from Seattle to Kansas to Chicago to Washington DC before she told me even internationally. She's appeared on important shows um, like Democracy Now! I saw her speak, which was, which was incredible. So uh, a public, apology to the Payne family from uh, just from me that we we did not have you here sooner. Um, we should have had you here when this book was published. Um, and we're glad you're here today, but I, I wish we, we had we brought you in sooner than this. So the debtor arising is the winner, as was said before, of the 2020 National Book Award for nonfiction, Kai Magazine's 10 best nonfiction books of 2020, a New York Times Notable Book of 2020 and Editor's Choice Selection, named the best books of 2020 by NPR, the Washington Post, the Library Journal, and the Chicago Public Library. 
It's been excerpted in the New Yorker. It was long listed for the Andrew Carnegie Medal for Excellence in Nonfiction and was named Best Books of Fall 2020 by O, The Oprah Magazine, The Week, and the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. In the New York Times book review, they wrote, Les Payne's The Dead Are Arising arrives in late 2020, bequeathed to an America choked by racism and lawlessness. The book's subject, Malcolm X, knows this place well, though he died in 1965. Readers may pick up this biography hoping for a celebration of black pride and resilience in the midst of all this madness. But Payne, a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist who devoted nearly 30 years to the book before his death, meets these needs intermittently. But that's not his primary goal. Malcolm's presence is beautifully rendered, but the dead are arising, which was ultimately completed by Payne's daughter and principal researcher, Tamara Payne, is not a tribute or enshrinement of achievements. Instead, it reconstructs the conditions and key moments of Malcolm's life, thanks to literally hundreds of original interviews with his family, friends, colleagues, and adversaries. Nobody has written a more poetic account. W.W. W. Norton publishers wrote that Les Payne, the renowned Pulitzer Prize winning investigative journalist, embarked on in 1990 on a nearly 30 year long quest to interview anyone he could find who had actually known Malcolm X. All of the living, living siblings of the Malcolm Little family his classmates, his street friends, cellmates, Nation of Islam figures, FBI moles and cops and political leaders around the world. His goal was ambitious to transform what would become over a hundred hours of interviews into an unprecedented portrait of Malcolm X, one that would separate fact from fish, fiction. The result is this historic biography that conjures a never before seen world of its protagonist, a work whose title is inspired by a phrase Malcolm X used when he saw his Hartford followers stir with purpose as if dead were truly arising to overcome the obstacles of racism. Setting Malcolm's life not only within the nation of Islam, but against the larger backdrop of American history, as Tammy was just saying, the book traces the life of one of the 20th century's most politically relevant figures from street criminal to devoted moralist and revolutionary. With a biographer's unwaving determination, Payne corrects the historical record and delivers extraordinary revelations from the unmasking of the mysterious Nation of Islam founder, Bard Muhammad, who preceded Elijah Muhammad to a hair-raising scene conveyed in cinematic detail of Malcolm and Minister Jeremiah X. Shabazz's 1961 clandestine meeting with the KKK to a minute by minute account of Malcolm X murder at the Audubon Ballroom in Manhattan. This weekend, I had the opportunity to watch Judas and the Black Messiah, in which as part of a plea deal by the FBI, William O'Neill infiltrates the Illinois chapter of the Black Panther Party to gather intelligence on Chairman Fred Hampton. Of course, both Malcolm X and Fred Hampton were murdered as young men. And beyond the fact that the government was surveilling and manipulating the actions of black leaders, there were two things that came to mind when considering this film and this amazing book. The first is that as much as you may think you know, there is so much you do not know. And while so much has changed and that has to be celebrated, so much has not changed. The voices of Fred Hampton and Malcolm X are needed as much today as when they first spoke their words. What we learn about Malcolm X and his beliefs and teaching is as or more relevant and important today than ever before. Our country has been built on the oppression and state sanctioned murder of people of color. Young people in the Black Lives Matter movement are demanding racial justice in this country 
and are being joined by young people around the world in discovering the strength and importance of Malcolm X. The dead are arising must be a critical part of that education. Zebulon? Uh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Charlie. Yeah, um, yeah. I, there's so many things going on in my mind right now. But uh, I, you know, I, I, I really appreciate the points that have been made uh, already about the clearness, the clarity, and, and just the very subtle differences between maybe even approaching it, as you said, with an, a mentality of where and when, right? The key, the key being place, time, and place is so important. Um, or even making the point as you do uh, in that very powerful opening uh, passage of Malcolm's mother, Louise Little, uh, helping us to have a more full picture of, of her. Uh, I, I can't think of other, too many other works where we get a fuller picture. For example, I remember learning that she was uh, involved uh, in the uh, involved in the UNIA and also sending dispatches for the for the Negro world for the newspaper see that tells you a lot right there okay this is this is a very interesting person um, but even just making the point as you do that that the littles push the envelope in terms of that you know uh, like like they would try they would live in places that like like in Omaha I used to uh, teach at U University of Nebraska Omaha so I lived there for a few years they didn't they didn't want to live in North Omaha, I moved a little bit further uh, where it was considered, you know, areas that were by tradition or even by law in terms of these housing covenants and, and things that a lot of people don't realize, especially in the Midwest, uh, but also in Hartford and also in Massachusetts and also in, you know, depending where and when in Long Island. And so, so these, these are practices that we're familiar with. That whole idea of, I'm seeing a parallel here of, of, of Les Payne's life with Malcolm's in so many ways, uh, uh, that, that great migration, Jamal, that you were talking about, that, 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 that is so much part of your autobiographies as a family that makes such a difference. But then I, but then I think of Malcolm's words, you know, about, you know, he said, he said uh, you know, uh, stop talking about uh, the North, you know, if you're, if you're South of the Canadian border, you're South. So in other words, you know, pointing out those that that diff that great difference that we all tend to think of of you know of moving north came with its own problems and, and, and issues. Malcolm uh, was a northern leader in so many ways because he focused on those kinds of issues: the slum lords, the uh, issues of rent, issues of issues of the north. I guess, for lack of a better word, mm -hmm. called north. But uh, uh, the book does that. Well, maybe what was missing is a journalist's approach. Maybe that's what was needed. We want to know who were the people who gunned down Malcolm. We want to know that in a way a journalist with forensic evidence and, and resources and the, the interviews and so forth could tell us and help us to understand. I think that uh, was this is a, a, a biography of a different kind. So many ways. Well, I, I'd like to you know, roll it back from the asset stage because that is at the end of the book. Um, so much does happen <laughs> inside. <laughs> the book. Well, well, well. <laughs> um, but the whole approach of journalism, as you're saying, it's it, as I said, it's a different discipline than history, right? And and social sciences. What we're looking at is what answer those questions of what happened, but. The other thing about journalism, particularly when you're writing, you want you want to people be brought into the story to connect with the story and who you're writing about, and so and that's that's what's the key here for Dad. In that, you know, the other thing is we have to tell our own stories as Black people in this country, and not have everybody else tell our stories for us because what gets lost is our intimacy. We don't sometimes we can look at television shows and or see us in the media and not recognize these images because they're not us who is creating or telling those stories. So, it, and this is really important with in, in telling the story, but also bringing the facts to the story. And how do you do that? And how do you relate? Because you, you also have to think about even, I'm not saying that historians don't interview people because they have, and they do. But the questions that are asked are different. I mean, I was 
kind of talking about a little bit, historians tend to look at, because they know the outcome, you know, they look to see where things fit in and then try to see what other, you know, forces were brought in. Whereas a journalist is looking at like, well, who was there? Who really was there? And do we know who else was there? And is there somebody else I can talk to? And then it kind of grows and snowballs from there. So it's a different discipline and you're looking for a different angle of telling the story, you know? And then what happens sometimes, and it happened a few times in, in coming together in this book, is that these stories lead you in directions that you didn't think you would be going to, you know? And they happen a lot. I mean, honestly, it's working on this book for 30 years, exact points where that has happened, I can't remember. <laughs> right now or what was new what was new to me 25 years ago is not new to me right now so you know those kinds of questions are always difficult for me to answer but I just think it's important to understand why this book is different and important it's because of this kind of approach to it and it's I'm not saying it's better it's just different and it, and in being different it's bringing you different more information new information that is also going to be important and historians and and, and scholars are going to be discussing this information for years to come that's absolutely right. It's only from that approach would you know to talk to the brother that Malcolm was closest to, you know, to get that, you know, you're going to get a different perspective. A lot of that has to do with oral history and a lot of that has to do with uh, what my professors at UMass would call a black sensibility about family and how black culture works also is very important. And, and knowing Malcolm's backstory is so much more important that I think anyone realized for a long time. Um, you know, we, we, we're getting pieces of the picture of the puzzle, but not the full thing. Like, like he was, you know, class president, but then, but then uh, there was some confusion about, you know, was it more of a symbolic thing? But what starts to emerge, the more you learn about Malcolm's childhood is you realize that he was like a genius. <laughs> he was like a brilliant, brilliant, and obviously charismatic. We knew that. But, but brilliant from a young age, and that stood out to every teacher um, uh, and, and from my understanding. Uh, but, but my understanding is that, that your father also read Malcolm's autobiography about every five years, reread mm -hmm. it, sat with it. Uh, uh, that is remarkable to me and, and a very powerful one that I think a lot of uh, black men and women, but black men especially, because this story is so is so inspiring to so many of us who grow up and finally get this in our hands and read it. Uh, um, uh, but we now know a little better. We know not, that, that not all the characters in Malcolm in the Alex Haley autobiography were uh, exact people. Some there were some Composite. names change. Yes, right. This is a thing that happens and I think it's completely acceptable, but we needed an, a more clearer picture here. And this is such an important story to get right. Right. Well, and I also think it's important to understand the autobiography in itself. I mean, it started off to be, you know, a piece that Malcolm wanted to write a book promoting Elijah Muhammad's teachings in the Nation of Islam. And then during that process, he split with the Nation of Islam, left that organization. And Alex Haley, who really had no interest in writing that book about the Nation of Islam, Elijah Muhammad, really was always trying to push Malcolm to writing his own story. And so when the split happens, you know, Alex Haley is, you know, happy about that. But we also need to understand that Alex Haley is a filter also. And so an autobiography is really what the subject kind of wants you to know about them and how they tell their story. So we have that with Malcolm's autobiography, but it's also given through the filter of, of Alex Haley Very and good. whatever his agendas are. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Jamal, what did you think about, I mean, when did you first read Autobiography of Malcolm? I mean, in, in your house, you must have read that one, like. <laughs> actually, actually I, I didn't read it until I was in college uh, on my own. I uh, picked it up and, um, you know, and, and I mean, it totally changed my life, changed how I looked at the world and, uh, you know, and it just made things very clear. And, uh, you know, what I understood was that my parents had poured into me information that while they were telling me I didn't understand what they were telling me but then you know it germinated and so Malcolm X in the autobiography you know it, it it unleashed that and uh you know and I and I was you know 
you know, transfixed. And I, mean, I thought one of the things that that just totally, you know, blew me away is that here is a guy, you know, 50 years before me, you know, had thoughts that I had at, you know, 19 or 20. And when he was 19 or 20, you know, I mean, we had similar ways of looking at things. And, uh, you know, and I mean, it was just amazing that how could we be, you know, existing at so much time and, you know, and so, you know, but it speaks to the part of when we start to say how much progress we've made, but then how we're still in the same place. If we've made so much progress, why are we still in the same place, seeing the same things, having the same conversations? And I'm not suggesting that we have not made progress, but maybe what we need to look at is what is really going on around us and then what is really progressing? You know, are we just rotating? You know what I mean? And, 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 and it's just movement that we're talking about and not necessarily, you know, forward progress. And, uh, you know, and, and, and that's what I would say about it. I mean, I think that, you know, and, you know, and to that point of my father, I mean, he read a lot of books. <laughs> he read a lot of books many times, not probably as often as he read the autobiography, but I mean, he read, dad read a lot. <laughs> and he told us to read a lot. So, I mean, you know, that was not something that was, you know, that is out of the ordinary, you know, so I mean, like, he, you know, I mean, he had a library, and all of his books did not creak when you opened them. <laughs> they were, they were well worn and well read, trust me. I see. The other thing that's brilliant about my parents, though, and, and especially that when it came to reading is that he didn't um, always force us to you know, read what he had read. Like um, his, whole, he has a huge library with H. L. Mencken, and uh, yeah, I never got through an H. L. Mencken book. But um, through my dad, I was able to. I developed a real interest in Mark Twain, and not and not through Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer. I hated those books. I really did. But um, I really appreciated Mark Twain's other works, his essays, his travel essays. I, I really enjoyed put in Head Wilson. And what I was learning, you know, and my father would talk about this, that, you know, Mark Twain was really like the first American voice as a writer in America. He wasn't mimicking other, uh, the British writers, you know, because America was still a new country. So you had Hawthorne and stuff. Twain wasn't doing that. He was doing his own thing. And he was using the American culture. But the other thing about Mark Twain, and a lot of people don't talk about this, is that man, he was against imperialism. And he talked about that in a lot of his essays. So I, you know, was really, really kind of learning that through, you know, reading his stuff. And, and but the other thing about Twain is like, one of the things I learned from Twain was how to do transitions in writing, which I find very difficult to do. Um, but he, Twain was brilliant. He made it look really easy. So whenever I find myself stumped in writing, when I have to make a transition from one idea to another or a paragraph to a different and bring in a new idea, I go to Twain. <laughs> I just ordered two Twain books on Amazon right now. I'm like, really? <laughs> <laughs> Transitions? Yes. Those are, okay. Okay. Thank you. Because um, the book is not totally finished yet. It's still time to tweak it. Uh, that's wonderful. No, I bet books were made. I bet there was a lot of books, um, and 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 you know, you you really do get the sense here of of man. I'm talking about uh, Les Pay now, uh, who uh, who 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 was um, uh, kind of kind of bold and stood up, as you were saying, you know, and taught obviously, uh, and, and and him and, and Mrs. Payne taught obviously the family to do so and, and and sounds like steered you that's a remarkable story and, and I think one of the most beautiful things about this amazing book is the story behind it this family story uh, uh, of, of you know the sacrifices I'm sure uh, uh, that, that also arise uh, when one is uh, you know you know he, he tells the story of that speech that he heard at Hartford he, he went in and Came out, came out the parking lot. You know, went in, went in a Negro. Came out the parking lot, uh, a black man. A black man. He said it. Yes. And 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 that is, um, you know, Malcolm could do that. You know, uh, I remember Stokely Carmichael talking talked about, you know, you see that transformation with student nonviolent coordinator. And he said, you know, the, the more people read Malcolm, the more they got hooked on Malcolm, and uh, you know, <laughs> and the next thing you know, everything's, you know, changed and and. I think it's important for all all ages, all generations that may be watching this to understand that 
that depending on, you know, how far you go back, Malcolm, you know, really receives like sort of a renaissance of attention in the 1990s. And you talk about that introduction of hip hop, certainly product of that and right there age wise. Um, but before that, I'm also old enough to remember when Malcolm was still seen as kind of like someone you shouldn't talk about openly, uh, was, 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 was he was bad or, you know, or they would hush people. I remember a librarian, my quick story. Uh, I went to William Monroe Trotter Elementary in Roxbury, Massachusetts. Oh, wow. William Monroe Trotter, that's great. You We're know. fans of him. William Monroe <laughs> Trotter, you so, know, a columnist. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I want to hear from this pain, but I, 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 they, they, you know, uh, uh, I remember a librarian, good librarians and teachers there. And I remember one of them explaining to us very gently that, that, that they were taught to not talk about Malcolm X. Hmm. Um, that Malcolm X was considered to be dangerous. He told the truth. You, you talk about that in the, in the book as both of you authors talk about that in the book as well. Um, uh, that, that Malcolm, Malcolm's one of the things that he did really well was disrupting the smugness the arrogance, the puffed upness of some white folk at that time, right? Or this is a sort of anonymous, you know, uh, uh, um, you know, an, uh, you know, every every man kind of figure that he would sort of, you know, make make that point, you know, uh, uh, he's out there trying to get tan, look like you, you know, and and uh, uh, he who is he to be to compare to? You're you're nobody to be comparing yourself to him. And that was like, whoa, I'm sure. I mean, I'm, that predates me, of course, but I'm sure for the ears that, and, and the minds and eyes that took that in as your father and, 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 as you, and uh, you write about, that was a, uh, that's not a writing thing. That's not a book thing. That's a personal thing. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. That's, that's it. And, and the dead are arising indeed. The, 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 uh, that comes from, of course, you can talk about that. It comes from the nation of Islam. We should talk about, I guess, some of those things. <laughs> um, uh, you know, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, you know. Just, just Zebulon, I'd like my mother to share with you the story because, you know, my father did meet, you know, he went to attend an, an event with Malcolm and he actually got a chance to meet him. But my mother also attended an event where Malcolm was speaking and I'd like her to and speak to Absolutely. Yeah, I was at Howard University. It was my freshman year. And uh, one of the organizations I, uh, uh, I decided to uh, work with was Project Awareness. I don't know if you remember that history of, about Howard University. Stokely Carmichael was the president at the time. And he was working to get um, Malcolm X to Howard to speak. And he did come. He did uh, come to Howard in 19, uh, oh, I hate to say it, it's in the early 60s. 62. <clears throat> to Howard University, Ira Aldridge, which is called the Crankston, Auto part of that Crankston Auditorium at Howard. And he uh, debated, uh, I think it was Bayard Rustin. Yes. And he was, and Malcolm had just come off of speaking at Harvard University at the time. I was an usher as part of the Project Awareness. I was a, an usher at that program. And so it was very funny because the auditorium was sold out. People were standing to uh, hear Malcolm X. It was a combination of black and white people there at the time. But um, um, what I'm saying is that listening to Malcolm and as an usher, I forgot to pass out the program. <laughs> he had to keep tapping me because I was, I just became involved with what he was saying. He was so mesmerizing. Uh, Mom, I just want you to talk a little bit about, because you, you were at Howard University and yeah. what, because, okay, well, this is, I always thought DC as being chocolate city in the eighties. So we're talking black people are doing pretty well. And, and, it's a, and this is historically black school. What was it that made you want to go see Malcolm X 
being, you know, you, you grew up around Alexandria, Virginia, and um, now you're at Howard. And, and there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of discourse going on about Howard, be, about Malcolm, because actually when he got oh, there, yeah. he was told to go, that they wanted him to basically be prove himself that he would be able to attract people and had to go back and speak at uh, a debate at Ivy League schools. Well, and then that, was, um, that was before my time. That was before, right. Yes. But so what I'm just saying is that environment, what was that environment like? He came back, he came yeah. from Harvard. And of course it was a sellout crowd. Mm -hmm. And then after the program, some of the ushers and I, we were able to talk to Malcolm X after the program. But he was a very mesmerizing speaker, you know, and uh, you talk, Zevin, about uh, that people did not want you to talk or to mention um, that you had an interest in Malcolm X. That was very true. And um, I remember I said, after becoming project, uh, project awareness, awareness, I said, well, this is one thing I'll, I'll not tell my parents because they, they were in Texas. And so they, at that time, you know, you didn't have Twitter or Facebook, <laughs> so, you know, information, you know, didn't on travel you. As fast. <laughs> we, we, um, we received a couple of questions and, and Jamal had mentioned this before. So can you speak about um, how you see the, the nexus between Malcolm X and, and, and Dr. King? Um, and, you know, the way the, 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 they were portrayed to the public as opposed to, to, to really um, much more reality around the, the context of, of, of the reality of the messages that they, they both were conveying? Um, I mean, I can definitely say, w one thing I will just say in me on, off the top, I think my mom should give you a little even more context because she was there, really. Um, but what I would like to say is the thing to look about, look at the two of them is that Malcolm had, Martin Luther King had a quote, and I've heard Malcolm say this also, that um, segregation imbues segregators, i.e. white people, with a false sense of superiority, and it imbues the segregated Black people, in this case, with a false sense of inferiority. And so when you look at what Martin Luther King and the civil rights groups are doing as far as bus boycotts and the legal uh, fight. They were trying to overturn Jim Crow laws and the legal system that was not recognizing the civil rights of Black people. So they're dealing with the false sense of superiority that white people had in viewing Black people and how they also viewed themselves. And what Mark Malcolm was doing what, through his work because of his exposure to, to Garveyism through his parents and growing up um, and, and having a, a, a firm foundation of Black people and how Black people can thrive and, and are talented and can build up their own communities and, and thrive. And then in the Nation of Islam, which is building upon that also, um, he is looking at how Black people are internalizing this racism and how it gives them this false sense of inferiority. I.e. like when my father writes about in the essay, The Night I Stopped Being a Negro, where he walks in there and he's saying, I'm a Negro. And Malcolm is calling everybody, you know, he's referring to Black people, he's saying so-called Negro, he's calling them Negroes, and then he alternates that with calling, referring to Black people as Black people. And Black people in that hall are very offended by that, because Black is considered a derogatory term. They didn't want to be called that. My father said if he called his brother uh, Black, he would fight, and if he called him African, he'd be chasing him even now. So here you have Malcolm who's, who's using these terms, and it's upsetting people, including my dad. And then Malcolm says, okay, I see you, you'd rather be called Negro, but what does Negro mean? It means black in Spanish. So what you're saying is okay for me to call you black in Spanish and not in English. And so this opens up because my father's not saying I feel inferior, white, but he's like, wow, I've actually also internalized. We don't even know it's there. It's a survival tactic this, this, to get through the day when the law is you have to step off the curb when a white person passes. And if you don't, that does something to you as a person. 
And so you internalize that and it becomes a survival tactic. What Malcolm was trying to do was focus on black people overcoming that and, and in ways that they didn't even know that they had had it. And so I would look at that, that's really kind of the relationship. So they were coming at dealing with civil rights and, the, and, and representing civil rights in the United States. For the, they were coming at it, that was their goal to achieve it, but they were coming at it from different directions. But I would like my mom to talk a little bit more about it because she actually was alive. Well, in a sense, but I mean, people interpret it different ways because with uh, Darton, Dr. King, people felt, or well, there were people who uh, felt that it was a safer way to move through society as it was than the approach that um, Malcolm X had. And so I, I do remember how people really um, were totally against Malcolm X, but some of that, a lot of that was given from the way the press portrayed Malcolm X. It was quite negative. He was, now Malcolm X, I felt, he did not say anything to incite people, only that, why would you do that if you're a hum human being? You could do it, you would use common sense. And people did not like, uh, well, I guess I should say the white population. We're not used to hearing um, somebody talk to them in that way. So I say that as a black person, and there were several that would appreciate both, but they would tell you that they would think of it was Malcolm, uh, Martin Luther King, because it was safer at that time. And, and I want to add a little bit. I'm going to bring a little Malcolm into this. Um, <laughs> and one, and I had did this for a presentation for high school students. Is one of the mischaracterizations of Malcolm X is that uh, he preached violence, and he did not. He preached self-defense. He said that when the federal government has shown that it is, it is not going to do anything about violence against Black people by the Klan, then it is our duty to, for us, to ourselves to organize ourselves and let the government know that if they don't stop the Klan, then we'll stop them ourselves. And that's when the Klan is marching into your neighborhood and putting you on threat, burning crosses on your lawn you know, threatening, as in Malcolm's case, when his mother's pregnant with him, to have his family move out of town at gunpoint. And that's just how we open up the book. But Malcolm also did this. He also explained that when you do this, the media will call Black people racist and violent people in reverse. They will make you think of that if you try to stop the Klan from lynching you, you're practicing violence in reverse. And I will say that this is exactly what happened with my father as a columnist on Long Island when he talked about police brutality and they would call my father a racist in reverse and they would isolate him and call him the troublemaker. And this is, Malcolm was talking about this in 1964. That's amazing. So you talked a, a lot about the importance of context and, and you know, one of the great things um, among so many things, but, this this book and and I would disagree with you that you and your father are scholars. I mean, there is no there is no question about that. Um, but um, you talk about the importance of positioning Malcolm's life in the context of of the American story at that point um, from from before he was born uh, throughout throughout the course of his life. Thinking about context, what do you think it is that is making this book resonate with so many people today? Um, the success of this book is 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 incredible, um, and and as you you and I were talking beforehand, I mean, literally around the world. So, thinking about context then and context now, what is it that 
that you know people are just receiving this book you know so positively and and so powerfully i think that one there's a there's a clash in reality that's happening right now that um you can't turn your eyes away especially in this last year especially in the context of what's going on with the pandemic and by the way if you think about what was happening in america 100 years ago like in maybe over 100 years ago 1918 um we had the um Red Summer of 1918, where Blacks are beginning, not even beginning, but it is a ramp up of lynching of, of Black people for whatever reason. Crimes they didn't commit, crimes that they did commit, but don't give them a trial, whatever. There is a lynching. If they can find a reason to go after a Black person, they being white mobs, you know, who are targeting Black people to do this for different reasons throughout the country. That was happening in 1918, but also what was happening before that, we had a pandemic, we had the Spanish flu. So there's a re repetition of history. And so when we have even, we have a, again, a pandemic, and then we have these horrible crimes that people cannot look away from. And there are constantly being video. What happened with George Floyd? What happens with Ahmaud Aubrey? And this is constantly being brought up to the point that people cannot look away from this and it, it is catching on. But let's also understand it's not only happening here, it's happening all over the world. And so this is not, we have not uh, made people accountable for these crimes over the last hundred years. We've denied, we said we made changes and, and that is a thing of the past and it's not happening anymore. But meanwhile, black people are still being denied access to promotions to equal pay, to even getting education. Even when I was in college, there were white people who felt my white classmates, not all of them, but a lot of them did feel that black, all black students on that campus were there as, as uh, affirmative action quota candidates. And then that's still talked about today. So if this is still talk, talk there, this, is, this is a clash of realities happening yet again. So the question is, can, are we going to learn from history? Do we even understand what happened in the past? Do we learn from these lessons? And do we do the different thing this time so that we don't have to keep repeating this cycle and start a new cycle? We're going to make mistakes, but let's not repeat the same mistakes. Understand what happened historically and learn from those lessons. And I think that's what's happening. And it's happening right now throughout the world because as we had my shock father explain in his essay how veils came, fell from his eyes at the Malcolm X speech, Bales are falling from everybody's eyes around the world about a lot of things. And Charlie, I also think that it is a, the book sort of also have people confronting what they have been denying. They've been living in their denial. And for some particular reason, society has been catering to that denial. So they're confronting that denial at this point. And what I would say to that is, I would just want people to look with clear eyes at what we're actually witnessing. On January 21st, 2017, millions of women took to the streets in outrage of an election that they felt was against what they wanted. Not that they thought it was stolen, but they didn't agree with. They took to the streets and police and, you know, they showed us that they understand how to police situations across this country without gunships, without water hoses, without, you know, bear spray. And they were able to peacefully assemble millions of people on January, January 21st, 2017. But this summer during Black Lives Matter across this country, and we're not just talking about Black, you know, people taken to the streets. This was white, this was Asian, this was Hispanic black youth taking to the streets in Portland and they had gunships. They had helicopters flying above and they were willing to take people out. They have militarized police vehicles and they were ready to take people out this summer. And then January 6th happens. Where were the gun Where were, so the, so this is not about training. This is not about, well, they just don't know how, they're not trained. No, no, they know, they know what they can do. Because on January 6th, they allowed the line to just be broken. 
And regardless of planning or whatever, I'm saying that in one instance, gunships are there and they're ready to be deployed. And in another instance, well, you know, it's, it's unfortunate and, you know, we'll see what happens about accountability, but I hope that accountability happens. But I mean, we are witnessing this and yet people can still look at it and say, well, maybe it's just a training. It's not really white supremacy. It's not white supremacist units in the police and in the military. It's, it's the training. But they're showing us that it's not the training because there are two instances I just gave you where they did not have gunships and, 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 and water cannons and, and all those things. And they had millions of people. Well, not January 6th, but I mean, what I'm saying is, is that we're seeing this. And so what my dad and the story that he's telling is we're looking with fresh eyes at what this country is. We're lifting it up and saying, this is what this country is. White supremacy and all. And it's not to say, you know, I mean, this is, this is who we are. This is America. And, uh, you know, and, you know, and, and I think that, you know, people are looking at it and saying, okay, you know what I mean? And, and look, we've, you know, I mean, people say, wow, for this book to come out at this time with all this stuff happening. But I mean, if it came out five years ago, I mean, Trayvon Martin and Mike Brown was happening. I mean, like this stuff has been happening. So it's, it could have came out 20 years ago, but I mean, but now that it's coming out, I mean, this is, there is definitely it's a reckoning. Realities. There's a reckoning happening. And I mean, I think that, you know, but look, we're, we're more than ecstatic that people are receiving it and that they're seeing the words. And, and I just hope that people enjoy the writing because this is the last of his, you know, of his magnificent work. And I mean, he, you know, he gave all of himself to this. And my sister, I can't say enough how, to, you know, I mean, it, this could not have happened without her without her effort, you know, getting this across the finish line. And, you know, and, and our family is beyond ecstatic that, you know, I mean, like this book and this project has been like a little sibling to us. That's what I call it. It's our little sibling. And we're glad that everybody in the world now gets the chance to meet our sibling that my sister has been caretaking for 30 years. And so now, you know, I, I'm so happy that you've read it because the more people that read it, then Tammy has people that she can talk to about the information that she's been walking around for 30 years and hasn't been able to talk to anybody about it. So, I mean... You know, that's it. I, I just thank you for the time. Well, I, you know, I, I want to thank all of you. I also can't help but think about the columns that Les would write today about what's happening, about um, exactly what Jamal is talking about, about January 6th, about um, the, the loss of truth. Um, and, and, you know, what's going on in state houses across Yes. the country with with making it more difficult for specific groups of people to vote yes. um and you know it's it's all part of the same pattern it's all part of the of, of the same part of of this country and 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 you know someone sent in a question asking you know what people can do people need to educate themselves and people need to raise their voices and 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 like Less pain, and the whole pain family, um, not be afraid to speak truth to power. And I know that's a cliche today, um, but we need the voices. We need the voices of 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 all good people um, standing up for what is right and not allowing ourselves to to disbelieve what we see with our eyes. Um, you know, it, it this. It, it just we're living through through such a, a period of gaslighting where you're told to to not believe what you're seeing and and you know we we just we we can't we can't let it continue we can't let it continue uh, uninterrupted and and so I, i'm sorry i'm preaching but it it's no it's you know, the, right. where the country jolly is that the, you know less and i had great um, we felt that we should look to the youth, and that is the majority of the young people at this university, that they will be able to carry the torch, you know, because I think that their ideas, it is just amazing. I mean, even with the short time that we, I mean, it wasn't a short time, it was a year with uh, pan the pandemic, but I have seen so many people 
learn to retool themselves and to uh, retool the way they educate themselves. So I have great, um, I have great admiration and great hope for the future because I think they really hold the answer. You know, once they get to thinking, I hope that this book stimulates them. But once they get to thinking, I think that we will see that we have a, I th hopefully think that we have a better world. You know, That's and I, I agree with my mom on that, especially with the youth, especially from the conversation I've been having. I've spoken with a couple of high school students, uh, classes, and, and, and even with the college, you know, on the college level, it's just the conversation that I'm having, listening to people and how they're analyzing what's going on and how quickly they're getting it and how quickly they're able to also make that come from a position of uh, understanding what this is and not repeating the past. And so I wanna give recognition to that. And I also wanna put it out there, you know, in case people, I'm sure will ask, what would Malcolm think today and Martin think today? I mean, I think we, we need to understand something else is that Martin and Malcolm were very uh, successful in upsetting the, stat, the, the powers that be during their time. And if you think about those last years, part, and, and, I, and I'm gonna focus on Malcolm because that's what I spend most of my time on now, that last year where he was traveling to on his Hajj, um, going to the Middle East, going to Africa, going through Europe, he was meeting with high powered people, even college students who are now in positions today that are pretty powerful and e teaching here in the United States or working in different governments. Had he, that was during the last year of his life. Had he been allowed to have flourish with those those conversations and those relationships, I don't think that we would be where we are today. You know, because these people had access to power and resources, and and we're also listening to him because they were in agreement with what he was saying. They came to him. He was traveling, and a lot of them came up to him. So if he was, if, think about it, if those friendships were allowed to flourish, um, that we may not have been here. I mean, Malcolm, even after his death, was planning on going to a world conference that was going to be in China, supposedly. So he, he, could, he didn't make it, yeah. you know? Yeah. And so these are, we need to understand that Malcolm and Martin aren't, aren't here for a reason. So what we should also look at, what I encourage young people to do is to look at where they are, you know, whether they're going through the education system here at Stony Brook and becoming doctors and teachers and lawyers and so on and so forth. And, and looking at these issues that are important to them and fighting for them as well, not just speaking up, but helping to create legislations and programs that will you know, go against the superstructure that's already in power. And so that's how you can do it. You don't have to be out making speeches in front of hundreds or thousands of people. You, you can actually do the work where you are and, and, and influence people around you. And I encourage people to do that. And they already are. Even if you look at how Black Lives Matter is, is organized, there is no one person. I mean, it's a mountain, what, yeah. Black Lives Matter is in Louisiana. It's not what it is in Georgia. It's not what it is here for yeah. a reason. Because these are different issues that are, that are affecting these different places. And they're dealing with the local issues. And we have to think about how local politics run. How is that organized? And thinking about how we get our candidates who are really gonna help get these programs forward or force those candidates to see the importance of getting these working against their interests, maybe of greed and, and seeing that this will be really important even if they you know, can work against their greater interests of greed. Because that unfortunately, particularly a lot of our local candidates are dealing with, it's, it's about money for them. It's the kind of stuff that Malcolm used to call out and less. Everyone should just read this. Yeah. That's all you got to do. Listen to Malcolm. It's start. all. Start. <laughs> start with the book. <laughs> so let me, because um, I know we're, we're, we're running past time, but let me uh, oh, yeah. thank the Payne family um, for, for joining us this evening. Um, I, I anticipated a great evening. We had a, a great evening and, and there's so much more. Um, there's so much more. And, and as Zebulon just said, I, you know, I encourage everybody who's uh, seeing us tonight to, to, to get a copy of the book. 
um, and, and, and really dive into it. And, and then we can have more discussions about it. Um, let me also thank Zebulon for, for joining us tonight. Um, he is uh, somebody that has, has been bringing messages to this campus that are, are long overdue. And, 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 you know, as I said in the beginning, I consider him a partner, I consider him a friend. Um, the Center for Changing Systems of Power is, is, is really lucky to have him affiliated with, with us. Um, let me thank the alumni group for, uh, for helping sponsor tonight's event. Um, let me thank everybody who is in the audience. Um, we, we see you, we know that you know this is important. That's why you're, you're here. Um, and, and we need to work together to, to, to bring about really true change, um, not window dressing, but, but real true, true change. And last uh, plug is that the Center for Changing Systems of Power will be having uh, a different conversation each month and bringing thought leaders to, to campus um, now virtually, hopefully next year in person um, to engage in, in really the, the critical issues of, of the day. So thank you all for being with us. Thank you again to the, to the Payne family and thank you to, to, to Les. Um, we've all learned just so much um, from, from everything that he's taught us. So thank you for this evening. Uh, can I just say one last thing and um, just sure. let people know if they want to reach out to us, they can reach us through our website at thedeadorarising.com, which is the title of the book. And um, you'll have links to other events that we've done as well as um, a way to email us. We'll check those. I, won't, I don't know how quickly we'll get back to you, but we'll definitely be reading the emails. <laughs> and we also like right. to thank our... Agent Faith Charles and the uh, and Bob Weil, our editor on this book. Excellent. And a, and a cool. shout out to Liz Bass, who also was very helpful. <laughs> and to all the people that put this on, but most especially hearing that Dr. Francis Brisbane is in the audience, it definitely warms my heart. And as I was telling Zebulon, oh, yes. you know, I know that if she's watching, she's sitting there, you know, she's watching us. And, uh, you know, and, you know, we, we you know, just, Thank you for all the support that you've given us and, you know, and from Stony Brook as well. Thank you so much. And thank you, Charlie. Thank, thank you. you. All right. Everybody be, be safe and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you.